Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those connected by telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your moderator, Christine Micah, Improvement Lead at the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Please go ahead, Ms. Micah. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's on-call webinar, Using Patient Stories for Learning and Improvement. Uh, my name is Christine Micah, and I'm an Improvement Lead at the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, and I'm really pleased to be your host today. CFHI is a not-for-profit organization funded through an agreement with Health Canada. We work shoulder to shoulder with healthcare leaders to support implementing and enhancing healthcare improvements across provinces, territories, and regions. Since 2009, we've been partnering with patients and families to harness the tremendous potential of patient voice to drive improvement, and I'm really pleased to be sharing some of the excellent work in storytelling with participants across Canada. We're pleased to have more than 180 registrants for this session today. As I introduce our guest speakers, I'd ask that if you haven't done so already, to please take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat box, as well as let us know how many people are attending from your location by completing the poll that you see in the center of your screen. I'm thrilled to be joined with a wonderful complement of speakers who will be sharing their research and experience in storytelling. Joining us today, are Carol Fancott. Carol's a clinical research leader at the University Health Network, where her research focuses on using patient stories for learning and improvement. Carol was also a contributor to a report submitted to the Federal Advisory Panel on Healthcare Innovation, examining patient engagement as an innovation capable of transforming Canada's healthcare system. Lauren Lee is a patient advisor who has brought her lived experience as a journalist, cancer survivor, and staff member of London Health Sciences Centre Office of Patient Experience to drive improvement. And finally, a warm welcome to Lisa Hawthornthwaite. Lisa is a senior patient experience specialist at the London Health Sciences Centre, and in this role she supports the organization to strive for and achieve patient and family-centered care excellence. As a fellow with the Associated Medical Services, Venus Project, Lisa has developed a curriculum focused on using patients as storytellers to engage frontline staff in self-reflection about effective patient and family-centered care, which we'll share a lot more about today. A warm welcome to all of you. We are pleased to provide simultaneous interpretation for all of our on-call webinars. This may result in a few quick pauses in the dialogue today and I'll remind our speakers to please speak slowly. We'd invite you to participate in our chat box today in the language of your choice, and we do have dedicated time at the end of the webinar to answer any questions or comments that come up throughout the discussion. On today's call, we'll guide participants through a discussion that will enable participants to reflect on your organization's aims to use patient stories, particularly as they link to improvement and patient and family-centered care. Participants will consider why patient stories, patient stories are being used, who's telling them, for what purposes, and in whose interest. And participants will consider the structures that are required to enable learning from stories to support changes in practice and processes of care. At the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, we recognize improving patient and family-centered care as one of three strategic goals to improve health system performance. Our work and engagement is embedded into programming and curricula across our areas of focus. Within our patient engagement portfolio, supporting organizations embedding the voice of the patient is used to accelerate improvement. Presently, we are the lead Canadian organization supporting the Better Together campaign. This North American campaign is spearheaded by the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care and aims to encourage a thousand hospitals to adopt family presence policies. Recognizing that families are more than visitors in the lives of patients, family presence policies that welcome a designated partner in care to have unrestricted access to their loved ones improves the quality of care and health outcomes. If you're thinking about adopting family presence policies or already have done so, please consider signing the pledge and visiting our website for additional materials and resources. In 2013, C 
CSHI supported 22 teams across Canada in engaging patients and families to support quality improvement. Early evaluation results demonstrate that patients and families bring new insights and ideas than providers working on their own. Across the 22 initiatives, improvements in safety and efficiency, communication, and experience were achieved. And finally, through our leadership role in patient engagement, we have developed a resource hub that contains over 200 free open access tools to support engagement for improvement in your organization, such as the storytelling resources Lisa and team will be discussing today. The hub is also available as an app on your Apple and Android devices. So at this time, it's my pleasure to turn the webinar over to Carol. Um, who will set the context a little bit um, about their experience in storytelling. Over to you, Carol. Thank you, Christine. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Carol here, and thank you to CFHI for hosting this webinar, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. So as Christine alluded to, Lisa, uh, Lauren, and I come to this topic of storytelling with, with different lenses, from research, from practice, and from patient perspectives. And so throughout this webinar, you will hear us come in and out at different times to share these different perspectives. And while we work at different organizations, Lisa and I connected our work through the AMS Phoenix Project. And AMS is a small charitable foundation that aims to bring compassion to healthcare. And through the Phoenix Project, I received grant funding for my doctoral research work, which is what I'm going to be speaking to today. And Lisa was awarded a fellowship, which allowed her to implement storytelling practices at London Health Sciences Center. So this webinar is a really nice venue for us to come together to share what we've learned through research and practice. So I will pass you on to Lisa now. Thanks, Carol. It's Lisa. Um, when I was asked to think about how to define patient experience for our organization, I knew from past experience that stories about healthcare could bring a deeper understanding as to what patient and family-centered care really means, and then spark some needed attention to quality improvement from the patient and family perspective, just as Christine described. It was through the AMS Fellowship funding I was able to collaborate with others to design and evaluate an approach to sharing stories. And so we've landed on a workshop model for preparing storytellers, the creation of a facilitator toolkit to guide the staff, and a structured approach to sharing stories with a very interactive component. So our work is based on nine workshops and facilitating over 150 sessions with currently 25 storytellers on our roster. And stories are everywhere, especially on social media. And while we have shared many stories at LHSC, we're very thoughtful about who, where, when, and why stories are shared. Today, the examples we're sharing with you are from providing education and orientation sessions. Our curriculum defines what patient experience is in an engaging way. It helps to illustrate the vital behaviors, the actions, and the attitudes of patient and family-centered care. In stories, we address what went well and what could have been better for quality improvement insights. I started my research work. There was actually very little in the literature that spoke to how stories were being used, for what purposes, and importantly, with what impact. And so my research looked to consider how we can help to inform practice in this area by seeking out those and seeking out and learning from those organizations that were known to be leaders in this area of learning from patient stories. So in the spirit of storytelling, I would like to bring Lauren in at this point. And as Christine mentioned, Lauren is a patient advisor who also works together with Lisa in a paid position at London Health Sciences Centre and has assisted in the development of their storytelling curriculum, which includes the workshops and facilitator guides. And they will be speaking more to this throughout the webinar. So over to you, Lauren. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you uh, for having me today. Um, I'm going to, I hope you see this slide with a few of my pictures up in front of you, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about them by way of introduction. 
as you can see, I come from a very uh, wiener-friendly household. And uh, also, you'll see some pictures of uh, my best friend helping me uh, fundraise. And then up top, me as my career uh, as a magazine journalist. Um, that's me getting the scoop at a racetrack while I was covering horse racing. And uh, what I'm here to do, uh, first and foremost today, is I'm going to share uh, my core story with you, uh, how I would share to one of our educational um, sessions. And uh, after that, I'm going to tell you how we modify it depending on the audience at a particular session. But for right now, straight up, I'm just going to start with how I would start uh, any session that I've been a part of here at LHSC. And what I would say is I'm here before you today because about five years ago I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And to tackle that problem, my doctors and I chose that we would do a surgical course of action. And we decided that I would have a double mastectomy and proceed with immediate breast reconstruction at the same time. And the plan we came up with was that I would use some excess tissue from my stomach. Spoiler alert, there was some to take there. And uh, we just transplant that up and remake me some new breast using my own tissue. And now that's one long and very involved surgery. It's about 10 to 12 hours. But the benefit for me was that, you know, it would be done all at once. One surgery, one recovery, get back to life. And, you know, I love the sound of it when my doctor said, picture it like this. You'll go to sleep with boobs. You'll, be, you'll wake up with boobs. And all of that sounded pretty good to me at age 33. Um, unfortunately, this Sleeping Beauty fantasy didn't end up being my reality. I did, in fact, wake up with boobs. However, uh, shortly thereafter, I developed a series of bizarre complications. Suddenly, my one surgery became six surgeries with collapsed veins, blood transfusions, blood clots, and ultimately both of my newly reconstructed breasts needed to be removed as well. And as I joke with my surgeon at the time, you know it's been a bad week when you've had yourself a quadruple mastectomy. Um, all of these complications were very rare and extremely unexpected. Uh, I've never been smart enough at math to calculate the odds of everything, but I know about five things that had the 1% chance of happening all happened. And there was no one to blame or anyone at fault. It was just bad luck. But within that situation with so much bad luck, there was a lot of good too. And that came in how I was treated by the members of my healthcare team. And despite the problems I encountered or the disappointment I felt, they somehow managed to make me feel cared for and maybe even more importantly, cared about every step of the way. And it sort of shook out like this for me is I could handle that things didn't go according to plan because unfortunately, someone does have to be that 1%. But when that's the case, and it's you, it became important to feel that such a disappointment um, affected the members of my team and not just me. That it wasn't just another day at the office or win some, lose some, we'll get them next time, that kind of attitude. And I can tell you that my doctors and nurses were absolutely amazing on that front. I remember my surgeon saying to me, this is awful for me too. I don't take this lightly. The failure of this weighs heavily on me. And, you know, I appreciated this so much, just the lessening of the detachment from the situation, but also that feeling that if we were going to be a part of a team, then at least to some degree, my wins should be your wins, but our losses should be shared as well. And it was also the frankness and honesty of those words and that feeling it wasn't following a, you know, a script of maybe exactly what you should say in a certain circumstance. And I had just so many examples of people being real with me or being candid with me. I was about to go in for a procedure one time, and I asked, you know, relatively speaking, how painful would this one be? And the resident said back to me, I wouldn't know. I've never had this done to me, but I can tell you what other women have told me. And these may seem like small things or throwaway comments in the course of your day, but I can tell you that these moments of authenticity add up. And generally speaking, you can tell when someone is going through the motions of caring versus actually caring. Um, on the flip side, I've had, you know, a well-meaning but maybe a little bit detached intern sort of robotically pat my arm and say, there, there, this too shall pass. And I can tell you that didn't have nearly the same impact. 
And a final moment I'd like to share is while I was waiting in the surgical unit to go in for one of my last surgeries. Up to this point, I'd been pretty good at rolling with the punches, I thought, <laughs> throughout all these weird complications. I'd had the perspective of losing my dad to pancreatic cancer shortly before this, and so my problems had always seemed small and fixable by comparison. But on that day, this crazy sequence of events seemed to catch up with me. And one of the nurses who I'd been dealing with throughout sat down and asked me how I was doing. And without my usual joking demeanor, I said, you know, this is bullshit. And I guess I was expecting her to say something like, it'll be okay, or hang in there, or God forbid, this too shall pass. But she looked me in the eye, and she emphatically said, yep, this is bullshit. And it was perfect, and it was real, and this is bullshit was more comforting to me than all the cheerleading in the world or any explanation she could have given me. And a few months after this, I remember being at home and getting this exit survey in the mail inquiring about the care I'd received while I was in the hospital. And I sat down with it and I took it seriously and answered all the questions. And looking back at me was this glowing review. And at first I sort of laughed at how little correlation there was between all the problems with my surgery and this <laughs> extremely positive feedback I was about to hand in. But when I stopped laughing about it, I started to think about how special that is. And now I always go back to the same thought. Things don't have to go perfectly, but I knew, do need to feel like we're in this together, good or bad. And I know you can navigate a lot of bumps in the road when you feel acknowledged and supported by the members of your health team. And that includes everyone from doctors and nurses, technicians, staff, porters, even security guards. And thinking back on that survey, I think it's important to not have that tunnel vision because it's not always a linear relationship, this thought that a good outcome equals great care or a bad outcome equals bad care, because it's not the case. There's no absolutes in any of this. And I can tell you that there can be less than perfect care in perfect outcomes, as well as outstanding care in disappointing results. And sometimes the difference between the two can just be found in sincerity these principles of patient-centered care, and moments of authenticity. And so that's how I usually start um, a storytelling session at LHSC. And then afterwards, in the second half of my time with the audience, I'll usually bring specific examples uh, from my patient care journey that relates directly to the audience. I sort of think of my storytelling <laughs> a little bit as a a la carte menu. I don't bring all my stories with me every single day, but rather I'll select little moments in my care that will hopefully resonate with that audience on that given day. For example, one time I spoke in front of a group of pharmacy technicians and also at a patient safety day. And that day I talked about a time when I had to speak up when a new doctor wanted to give me a drug that I knew from the past I had had a scary reaction to. And so I kind of used this story to underscore the importance of communication and how patients should be partners in care. Another time, I had a wonderful opportunity to speak at a perioperative ground grand round session for an audience of surgical residents and nurses. And that day, I told a story about waiting to go in for an emergency surgery and how there was this extraordinarily mindful resident who provided both clinical and emotional support in a really scary moment for both my husband and I. Furthermore, in a session on diagnostic imaging, I brought several experiences I've had, you know, with CT scans and ultrasounds and x-rays, and, you know, some of the either sensitive or insensitive behaviors I've encountered through the years from the technical staff. And so this is all very fluid, and I feel like the tailoring that goes on and the matching with the audiences gives us the best opportunity to hit our mark with every single audience we go in front of. Thank you, Lauren, for sharing some of your experiences. So I would like to pause for a second just to let you reflect on some of the takeaways that you, have, you may have taken from Lauren's stories. So it's interesting because I only heard some of these experiences a few days ago as we were prepping for this webinar. And what struck me immediately was how articulate and Lauren was in recounting these experiences. 
and how interesting I found it, how she was able to separate this notion of outcome from care. So she relays some terrible experiences that she had related to her outcomes, those things that went badly, her, the 1% that, that she represents, um, but, then ex but then acknowledges the genuine ways by which staff had actually helped her to move on and how they validated and acknowledged her experiences and these outcomes that she was having. And so what I took from Lauren's story is, is the cor courage that it takes to tell a story, but equally the courage that it takes to hear these stories and to accept these uh, outcomes and to respond to them in ways that not only evoke empathy, but respond in kind, in authenticity and genuineness. So thank you, Lauren, for sharing that. So as we move on, I, I would like you to keep Lauren's story in the back of your minds. And we're going to be thinking about what do organizations actually do when they hear stories like Lauren's. So the first thing I would like to highlight are the many different kinds of stories that are told. And for my review of the literature, stories seem to fall into two main buckets. Um, these buckets being that of the stories of experiences of care. So the ones that Lauren was just sharing with us. Um, and then the other bucket really is those types of stories um, that talk about experiences of illness. That is, what is it like for someone to live with a certain disease or a certain illness? Um, and these are often stories that are told in the realm of education for health professional or student learning and also for peer support. I think within this bucket of stories are also a lot of those stories that we hear, these stories of courage, those inspiring stories of resilience, of someone who has overcome an illness or disease or health issue, and often with the help of organizations or people with treatment and procedures that occur. And often these are stories that might be used by foundations for fundraising purposes. But the types of stories that we're talking about today, specifically for learning and improvement, these tend to be those stories of experiences of care. What is it like to be a patient receiving care in this way within this organization? Now, in his book, The Wounded Storyteller, medical sociologist Arthur Frank provides a typology of stories. And this is really a typology for stories of illness, but I do think they also apply to these stories of experiences of care. And these are stories of chaos, of retribution, and quest stories. And what we find is that often the patient stories that are shared, they're often framed as quest narratives. So they're taking a story of chaos. So for example, what Lauren shared of these terrible outcomes that had happened as a result of, of the procedures, but then making them into stories, quest stories, stories that we can learn from, stories that change can happen. And as leaders within our organizations, we are often helping to shape these stories by using tools or templates, workshops that we offer, um, coaching that is done. And it is in this way then that we begin to really co-construct stories together with patients by providing ways that we ask patients to reflect upon their stories, to provide details in certain ways using the tools and templates that we provide to coach and mentor them, or when we videotape a patient and then edit it to, short, to make it into a short vignette. These are all ways by which we're co-constructing stories together with patients. And so while the stories may be told in the words of the patient, there are subtle ways that we are indeed shaping it, which then leads to this first tension. Whose story is it? And thanks, Carol. I'm just going to jump in for a second on the storyteller's perspective of this. And I don't at all disagree with the premise that there is some co-construction in the stories. Um, but it's been my experience in working with Lisa here at LHSC that this has certainly been a voluntary co-construction, and that any direction I've received from hospital officials has sort of been because I asked, or <laughs> that, that advice had been given upon request rather than mandated in any way. It wasn't them telling me um, what I should say, but more giving me information and tools 
so my story could reach its optimal potential. And I feel like that's what I and many of my fellow storytellers just want, for my story to be used to the max. And so I just think it's really valuable to work with the hospital administration to understand the goals for the session or the makeup of the audience for the curriculum. So my story has every opportunity to resonate with the audience, and hopefully we can lead to a really thoughtful discussion thereafter. Thanks, Lauren. Um, the act of preparing a patient or family story has been described to me as therapeutic. It's that process of reflecting on what happened and making meaning from it. The workshop model we have developed has helped us to consider this emotional landscape associated with the experience of sharing healthcare and illness stories. And we know there is a powerful emotional dimension to the storytelling experience. Feedback from our storytellers highlight this element of catharsis and therapeutic benefit in storytelling. And that emotion can be unpredictable. For example, I've noticed one time a storyteller may seem detached from their emotions during a telling, but then another may feel overcome by emotion. The support in our workshops during a session, the debriefing process with the staff facilitator role, helps prepare and acknowledge that this is an emotional process for this person. The workshops do also prepare for the logistics of public speaking, time limits, we help the patient find their focus and their main objective for, for wanting to share their story. We offer practice panels and feedback. We give feedback both written and verbally. So another question that arises around storytelling is really who are the storytellers? Who gets to tell their stories? And so in my study, leaders and patients alike talked a lot about what is actually said in the story, its contents, and how important this was. But equally so, they also talked about how the story is told is also very import important, which really speaks to the authenticity of the storyteller. So someone who is able to share their stories in non-threatening ways, they're able to tell their stories in ways that are more solution-focused, they're telling them at the right time, and the person might be the right fit to tell their story. Because, as one leader noted, the ultimate goal is to be constructive and to make positive change. And in my study, all of the stories that I, all of the storytellers that I spoke with were patient family advisors. So they had basically been vetted already through the organizational processes to be able to act as advisors. But really, this leads to the next tension of who gets to tell their story. And the flip side of this is really whose voices are then silenced. Thanks, Carol. In our hospital setting, it has been anyone who has come forward or self-identified an interest to be part of our program. But the opportunity is mostly accessible to our advisors through word of mouth or staff in our network and at times through the hospital news. There are many different stories who are, and they're shared by very unique individuals. Some examples are stories of chronic pain, mental health, cancer, pediatrics, neonatal, renal transplant, neurology, critical care, immigrant and refugee stories, and bereavement. But we do recognize many voices are missing and agree. We see the readiness to share stories does vary, and participating in the workshop doesn't always mean that the person feels ready to publicly share. What I'd also like to note from my study was that while everyone would talk about a patient story, often it was a story of a patient. So where a healthcare leader or a staff member might be recounting a patient story that they had heard. Um, and while may, it may seem like a small distinction, it is an important one because it goes back to this whole issue of co-construction or really reconstruction of stories. So when we hear a story, we will all hear the story differently and take different things out of it. We're filtering it through our own lenses, through our own experiences, our own values, mm -hmm. of what we see as important. And so when we retell a story, we're actually retelling it or reconstructing it through our own lenses, which then leads to this third tension, in whose interests are we telling these stories? Thanks, Carol. And this is a pretty big one for me, and I think it's an important distinction. And I feel very strongly about you hearing my story 
and my words from me. Um, part of that is I think one of the true kind of unexpected benefits I've had in sharing my story is some of those great interactive discussions with hospital staff and providers that I've been able to have after I shared my story. Hearing that perspective from the other side of things has been so important for my understanding of my experiences, and I think it's essential in improving collaboration and finding common ground between us. So I want to be in that room. And also, from some research Lisa and I are conducting at LHSC, we've seen that other storytellers feel the same way in that audience acknowledgement and being in that room is very important to them as well. So in this case where someone might tell my story on my behalf, I just worry that there's a, you know, that loss of control over what is said, how it's said, and the loss of the connection and emotion that comes from direct sharing. It's my opinion that there's a major part of patient family-centered care is to be more inclusive of the patient in all aspects of healthcare. And so this picture of a hospital representative sort of reading my story into the record or telling it on my behalf seems a little disconnected to one of the core tenets of patient family-centered care. Part of my story, and many of the stories we hear, is a theme of striving to be seen as a person throughout the healthcare journey. And I just think, what better way to see me as a person than live, in front of you, hearing my words and letting me tell you my story? So the organizations that have been embracing storytelling have some common characteristics that allow stories to be gathered and shared. First, it seems that there's an underlying culture of patient family-centered care within these organizations. It would be inherently difficult to share stories for learning if there wasn't an underlying value for the patient voice. Um, but stories also act symbiotically with this culture. Not only do they help to build a culture of patient family centeredness, but they also support it and enable it. Um, and in each of these organizations, what I would note is that there's always strong leaders that have role modeled and supported the behaviors necessary to hear stories in non-defensive ways so that they are using the patient voice or seeing the patient perspective as an opportunity for further understanding, for empathy, and for learning. And importantly, um, these leaders also directed resources and supports to connect stories with improvement structures so that stories were not stand-alone vehicles, but rather they're linked in very explicitly with structures so that learning can happen and have a system in place where patients remain engaged in the improvement purposes, uh, processes. So as noted by this leader, I think if you're going to have people tell their stories, you need to have a system that's set up to actually do something about those stories. And to answer Carol's questions, how did an organization like ours use a story like Lawrence for Learning? Well, we do really see it as acting as a springboard for inspiring change, with leaders being very key to this. I'll share two examples of how leaders have engaged their teams following sessions. One of our corporate managers states, when patients share their stories, they reveal their priorities and the very real opportunities to improve the patient experience, as well as healthcare design and delivery. It is a privilege for our team to hear their stories. Our portering leader states, the use of patient stories is essential in the learning component and growth of staff. It gives us a chance to pause and reflect on the individual patient experience moments and bring this first-hand knowledge to why we are here and who we serve. So following the curriculum that we offer to the 90 staff in portering, they incorporated patient experience questions into hiring practices through specific patient experience questions in the oral and written interview process. So our office does continue to offer tools and resources action age for, and action aids for the next steps for engaging patients in quality improvement. We help guide them to apply patient and family-centered care to their specific area. And just to echo a little bit about what Lisa just said, I've seen ideas and inspirations that were sparked in sessions I've participated in as well. Uh, specifically, one example of this would be um, we did a session for diagnostic imaging here at the hospital, and we've seen ideas start to take shape out of that session. Um, we've been asked 
um, to come back and do further sessions so all the staff could um, hear what we had to say about patient family-centered care. And we know the leaders saw this session as the catalyst to start their own patient-centered care and patient experience improvement focus. So we consider those to be big wins when we see that kind of direct feedback. So these toolkits were built as we applied and revised our approach to our in-hospital curriculum. The workshop philosophy, our structure, materials, and processes are all provided within this guide. We also recognized the very unique role of the facilitator and wanted to capture the nuances as best as we could, especially the notion of the skills that are needed not only to create the safe space for sharing of personal stories, but to be able to discuss them constructively with our audience. So these examples provided by Lisa and Lauren is what Arthur Frank would refer to as thinking with rather than thinking about stories. And it's this recognition that stories are not static objects, but that they're created within a social milieu. So that in order to think with stories, we need to be reflecting on the stories within the context of our own experiences and our own values. And in these storytelling practices shared by Lisa and Lauren, what we also see is the room that they have provided for intentional dialogue, this notion of intentional dialogue, where again, stories aren't left out there on their own. They're not just told to be told, but there's an intentionality of how we link and reflect on the stories to help, to help with the learning in experiential, cognitive, and affective ways. So that the stories aren't just about evoking empathy, but that we're taking the time to reflect on our own experiences and what these stories can mean in our own lives and in our own practices. And the so what. So what have we learned from research and practice? We know that stories are powerful. But stories can also be used and abused, and that we need to reflect carefully as to consider what stories are we telling, to whom, and for what purpose. Carol, I really appreciate this quote from your research. For me, sharing stories is about patient and staff engagement. The advisor role, the movement in healthcare, is to ensure we have the patient and the staff perspective, and this is what we bring to our curriculum approach. We're also building some capacity for making decisions about improvement and finding these solutions about the problems we're having together. So I do think it's important to create resources for your organization to facilitate the use of patient stories and to remember that there are three parts, the storyteller preparation, the preparation of the audience, and the leader role. I'm always assessing and reinforcing the purpose for a patient story. What are the objectives? and what will be done with the story. I've learned to make this clear to both the speaker and to the audience. So the good news, we know that stories are powerful vehicles, but they cannot be standalone vehicles for change, and that we see how organizations have put supports and structures in place to ensure that we're actually learning from stories. And stories themselves are power. They can help to legitimize and validate the experiences of patients, and they help to engage patients in other ways within our organizations. And we've seen that power just from the storyteller perspective as well, um, being able to tell our stories. And we've seen tangible changes that have happened, uh, things that were asked for in stories come to fruition. And it's been so encouraging. As Lisa mentioned earlier, great strides were made um, after portering sessions where leaders um, incorporated many of the things that were talked about in the sessions into new uh, tools measuring patient family-centered care. We've also had some success in the process for docu documenting preferred names. Um, this is something that our patient speakers advocated for, to be called the name they wanted to be called, not necessarily what was on their formal documentation and a process sprang forward from that to make sure that we were doing what the patients wanted. Um, and finally, we've seen great influence in some policies here at LHSC in terms of discharge instructions, incorporating more of the patient's view in that, 
um, the policy on the use of restraints in certain situations, and also um, disclosure requests and how they're handled. In each of these instances, the patient voice was taken into account and applied to these policies. But, and there's always a but to this, we do need to be thoughtful as to how we use stories. And I think Lisa and Lauren have certainly give us, given us examples as have the organizations that uh, where I did my research thoughtful in how we're using the stories. But we also need to recognize the power that we still hold within organizations in deciding who's telling stories, to what audience, and for what purposes. And we need to be cognizant of the voices that are then silenced. And what stories are we not hearing then? And also to be aware of our own roles and how we are helping to co-construct stories. Thanks, Carol. In reflection about why we are using stories and my role as a leader who invites patients to share their stories, I have felt this real discomfort at times, anticipating some potential risks when assessing patients in acute or stable phases of their illness for a very public speaking situation. In this power I hold, I have to ask myself, what impact is it if they are reliving a traumatic experience? While the person is very motivated to help reduce stigma for mental health, for example, what is the risk to the person sharing about traumatic times during their illness? What about the audience's mental health receiving the story? I do think the structures and the processes help us. They help us get to know the storytellers and work through the process of making these decisions together. Thank you. And the only thing I would add to that is reflecting on my own storytelling, that this exercise is challenging on both an emotional and an intellectual level. Unpacking your past experiences and trying to apply them for an educational purpose is hard work. And therefore, it is so, so important to know that these stories are actually being used for a real purpose and to drive improvements so that effort is not in vain. Thanks, Lisa and Lauren. So when I, was, when I was conducting interviews for my thesis, there was a phrase from one leader that really, that really struck, um, stuck with me. And she talked about giving legs to stories. And so we look forward to opening up the lines now to hear your thoughts on how you and your organization may have given legs to patient and family stories. Thanks. So thanks very much to our speakers, Lisa, Lauren, and Carol. Um, the question has been asked, um, have you given legs to patient family stories? So if you would like to share an experience um, or have a response to that question, you're welcome to chat it into the chat box. Uh, and uh, Carol, if you just wanted to move on to the next couple of slides, I'll keep an eye out for that and we'll facilitate um, some of those answers and questions as uh, we get into the Q&A session. Okay. So thank you again to CFHI for hosting this webinar. And I will leave it, oops, sorry. So thanks, Carol. Um, it's Christine again, and we have reached our Q&A session. I think before we start the Q&A, I know there were a couple of resources that were mentioned um, by our team here, and those will all be made available to registrants of this webinar. Um, we also wanted to let you know that CFHI has the Patient Engagement Resource Hub, which features um, resources and tools that are open access. Uh, so if you are looking for additional information on, for example, storytelling or patient engagement for quality improvement, um, we do have over 200 resources there. Um, and finally, we are pleased to be publishing a book on patient engagement that arose from the work submitted to the Federal Advisory Panel on Healthcare Innovation. And this book will be available in early December and describes the concept of engagement-capable environments, where engagement has the potential to catalyze healthcare transformation. And this book provides 10 case examples of leading organizations who have utilized storytelling and other engagement techniques to ground improvement work in the experience of patients and families. So watch for more information on the book shortly. And we have arrived to our question and answer period. So I will just uh, take a moment to check out the chat. 
there is, in particular, a question from Kimberly. Curious to know what efforts are made to ensure it isn't the same patients always being asked to share their stories, but giving opportunities to a wide range of patients. So we talked a little bit about diversity and who gets to tell their story. Um, Lisa, I'm wondering if I can pose that question first to you, if you had um, a response to that uh, question by Kimberly. Sure, sure. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, I do coordinate the schedule for the patient storytelling, and I'm very thoughtful and mindful about um, who's sharing their story with what audience and to give everyone equal opportunity. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's my concern and why I look at sort of all of the presentations coming up over the next, you know, six months, and then I would, um, you know, schedule people uh, to give everyone uh, an opportunity. You know, there are certain stories that fit certain audiences, um, you know, and the, the more challenging audiences, some for me, sometimes are committees, so, um, but we still wouldn't have the same storyteller repeat to the same audience. Thanks very much. And I did just a moment ago see a couple of people typing in. Um, and, you know, related to that question, it really does make me think about recruitment and recruitment efforts. And, you know, instead of relying on the same one or two individuals, um, I wonder if you wanted to share a little bit about um, the recruitment of patient and family advisors at uh, London. Did you want to share a bit about that, Lisa? Um, sure. We, we've had uh, success using, you know, many different ways of recruiting advisors. Um, when they do the onboarding process to become an advisor, we do mention the opportunity for storytelling as a role that our advisors play. Um, but of the large group that we have, 130 advisors, there are currently about 25 who are prepared to share their story and um, are, you know, comfortable with with being part of the curriculum. Um, hi there. Oh, yeah. Hi there, it's Karen here. I just, I also just wanted to add, you know, on reflecting on Lauren's story and thinking about some of the people that I interviewed in my research work, that, that patients aren't just they don't just come with one story that there are, that there's a whole series of experiences that they're able to share and I think as Lauren had commented on you know depending on the audience and and, and what potentially the learning could be there might be um, some experience that could be shared with that I think though what the literature is starting to point to is just some concern I mean there's always those tensions about the you know, what they call the professionalized patients, so the patients that that are around more, that sort of do start to know the system, and, and how do their experiences play out if they are sort of repeatedly um, invited in many ways. And so I, I don't think there's any straightforward answers to that, but I think it's recognizing that there's a whole range of experience that any one of us can bring at any one time. Um, but also recognizing that often the pool of patient advisors or the people that are willing to share their stories can be small. And so what, what are the dangers or the tensions that exist if, if they're repeatedly called upon? So thank, thanks very much for your contribution there. Um, another question from Audrey is asking, what, what are people's views on the education gaps in this field? So yes, for example, at UHN and London Health Sciences, um, this is happening and they're equipping their own staff with tools. Um, did you have any comments, and this is really for the three of you, and perhaps I'll start again with Lisa, then Lauren, then Carol, um, about any perspective you may have on education gaps in the system as a whole. Um, I, I guess I'll comment from my own personal experience in that the, the gap is um, the, the system's desire to be patient family centered and sort of understanding, you know, what can what what that means when you execute something like that. So, you know, in the in the example of education and curriculum, um, you know, fully understanding 
the engagement piece and um, the professionals role in helping to support patient advisors um, for many things, not just our curriculum. Uh, I think there's a, there is a true gap there. There's a lot of places to learn um, how to do this well and um, you know strong long-standing history in the pediatric uh, world, but there's definitely a gap and um, you know I think we're, we're, we're slowly uh, closing that, but there's there's lots, lots to learn and a few resources, you know, in the hospital settings to make something like this happen. And I, I really understand that. And uh, Lauren, I'm not sure if you had anything um, to add from your experience and perspective. I'm sure this is likely new to you, but I'm making assumptions um, prior to your getting involved. Did you have any comments sort of on the state of um, um, storytelling? Just briefly, um, just because I am sort of from the outside looking in and new to the hospital world, um, aside from being a patient, obviously, um, I've been somewhat encouraged by, um, I've had the opportunity to attend a few conferences or, or events, and, and the people that are approaching us are it, usually when I'm standing beside Lisa, and interest in this type of program and um, starting something similar at their place. So I, I, I know that gaps exist now and I know everyone isn't quite as formalized in doing these things, but I'm very encouraged by what I see as the appetite to do so being out there from at least people that have interacted uh, with us in the like <laughs> larger communities and, and getting out of our own area. So I've been quite encouraged by what I've seen just anecdotally on that front. That's great. And Carol, anything to add? Yeah, you know, it makes me think of, yeah, I think in the early days with patient engagement, there was a lot of focus on how are we preparing and doing orientation with our patients to make sure that they're ready to engage and that they understand the system. And it makes me think of, uh, you know, some interviews I did with leaders and they were acknowledging and saying, they, they did a lot of that work up front, but then they realized how much work was needed to help staff be ready to hear the patient experiences and how they, they needed to backtrack a bit and spend time with staff and other leaders to really prepare them. And I think it speaks to the work and, you know, and sort of foreshadowing the book that's coming out in December, but this whole notion of engagement capable environments. It's not just the patient telling their story and, and having the uptake. But it's helping staff prepare to hear some of these experiences, and it's leaders that really lead the way in terms of how they respond to stories and experiences and the kinds of things that they're willing to do and the supports that they're willing to put in place to support learning from, from hearing from patients and engaging with patients in meaningful ways. Thanks, Carol, for your perspective there. Um, a couple more questions, mostly related to logistics around storytelling and, and what we've heard today. So to you again, Lisa, do you offer different ways for patients to share stories? So not necessarily just behind a podium, um, but in panel format, Q&A sessions, uh, through written, written form, etc. Yes, yes, absolutely. We do all those ways. Um, panels are part of our nursing orientation. Our corporate orientation is a, a traditional speaker, um, but we, we do workshops with the existing staff as well. So not only do we present more than one story, often two to three, um, the advisors stay and participate in identifying um, behaviors and actions of patient family-centered care for their role. So we're very much um, you know, taking different approaches depending on the purpose of the session. Uh, we also just um, created a video story for our patient safety conference. Uh, again, the patient was there. We, we pre-recorded her story, and then the family participated with, with the audience in the discussion that followed the story. And we had specific objectives around teamwork and communication uh, to highlight. Very, very interesting. Thanks uh, for sharing that format. Um, there was a question related to time, um, and how much time in your meetings do you reserve um, for a patient story? Does it depend on the specific meeting per se or the format? Um, but if you had any perspective on, 
you know, for those who are thinking of doing this, what, what kind of time does this take? So we do adjust our um, approach depending on the time, but our workshop, if we're doing a, a workshop with existing staff and providers, it's typically about an hour and a half. Um, but we have done sessions that are 30 minutes and 60 minutes. Um, the purpose of that session, you know, is made clear at the beginning. Um, you know, typically some of our meetings that have patient stories part of that, we usually have a 30-minute uh, time slot where the story is shared and the discussion follows. So it does vary. And uh, thank you very much. We do have time for one question, and Serena is asking, how have you used stories to complement and augment more quantitative statistics that you get from large-scale patient experience surveys, or would you use them as separate or parallel tools? Um, and it makes me think of a quote from Brene Brown that says, maybe yeah. stories are just data with a soul. So if you had any um, insight in, into that quantitative, qualitative, mm -hmm. and how do you mix them? Yeah, thank you for that. And our first slide really spoke to that. And our um, quality safety committee, the corporate committee, when we do our patient experience update, which is uh, twice a year when we have a full meeting uh, dedicated to um, patient experience, that data along with patient stories are selected, as well as our community advisory engagement group. Um, we are often selecting stories that illustrate um, the learning from the data. Our ED nursing skills fair that we're doing right now, um, we are highlighting on our ability to um, provide emotional support and reduce anxiety because that's a score low, a low score in the um, NRCC results. So the stories and the activity are associated with empathy in that session right now. And if I, if I can just jump in here, I think, you know, the organizations that I went to, I think this is where they, they probably excelled in terms of being able to take stories and that they were, they're another form of data basically, but they were able to bring it in into their quality structures so that just as we would look at any of our patient experience data or our incident reports or anything else, they were brought in as another form of data to be able to look at and consider. And, you know, it just sort of provided that more wholesome approach of understanding what's going on here um, and, and often then became, you know, where stories can become the catalyst then for change because we can look at the numbers, but when we actually hear of an, act, of an actual experience and the impact that it had from the patient perspective or the family perspective, that sometimes gives people the jump start that they need to, to take action. So it's really being able to combine them together. It's not, it's, it wasn't a selection of, oh, at this time we're going to pull in certain kinds of data. It was just always there as part of the whole set. Thanks, Carol, very much for that perspective. And it, it seems like that really is the way going forward in terms of using um, the data and marrying the two um, together. So at this point, um, I would thank the speakers very much for your participation on the webinar. Uh, and just to let uh, registrants know that we do have upcoming webinars, which are, of course, free. Um, our flagship extra program is now accepting applications. On November 15th, join us to hear more about how you can move your quality improvement project from the side of your desk uh, to front and center with dedicated coaching and content support provided by CFHA faculty and coaches. And on November 24th, join us for part two of our Shifting Care from home, Hospital to Home webinar featuring the Inspired program, which redesigned care to ensure patients living with COPD had access to the right care at the, at the right time. And finally, one in four residents in long-term care in Canada are receiving antipsychotics without a diagnosis of psychosis. To help address the appropriate prescribing of antipsychotic medication in long-term care facilities, CFHI launched a collaborative, and session one of this on-call series will feature a case study from Sienna Senior Living in Ontario, focusing on strategies for your organization that you can adapt and use to improve care for the elderly. Please do visit our website for the complete on-call lineup and to register. 
I would again like to thank our speakers uh, very much for participating in the session. They have left um, their email addresses, which you will get um, as part of your materials. Uh, please do fill out the poll. This really helps us to inform how we can improve um, as a quality improvement organization. Uh, we, your feedback is extremely important. Uh, so please let us know um, how, how we've done today. So we'd ask you to answer the question, this webinar increased my knowledge of why patient stories are being used, who is telling them, for what purpose, and in whose interest. Please let us know, I've learned something new about using patient stories to support changes in practice and processes of care. Overall, I was satisfied with my webinar experience. I will be able to apply what I learned from this webinar in my workplace. And let us know if you have any other comments or suggestions today. So this does conclude our session for today. The, re the recording as well as the materials made are part of the session will be made available by email. Thank you very much and have a great day.